words of the textbooks. Now, did an economic recession cause a revolution in Iran? As economists have claimed, Looking at global events over three decades later, suggest, perhaps yes. but not a recession on the domestic economy, rather a recession on the industrial world's economy. A strange but consistent equation that to this date remains unchanged and unexplainable. That brings up this question, then how did this revolution happen, really? I mean, well, a lot of people are looking at Khomeini. I don't. I think, well, as we know, Khomeini hijacked the whole thing, but I put the blame on the intellectuals of Iran during that time. Now, I was 20 years old, mind you, and I, I left in 78 to come here to study and then go back and make movies or whatever, but uh, because of the revolution, I never went back. But, but I was there, I was around, I was at Kanun Parvesh Fekir Kudakan, and I was around intellectuals. And I would say 99% and a half of these intellectuals had sympathy and were more towards Marxism and communism. <laughs> Reza Shah Pahlavi ascended to the throne on December 15, 1925, setting forward plans of modernizing the social, economic, military, and cultural institutions within Iran. However, realizing Iran lacked the skilled professionals necessary to accomplish these modernization plans, another plan was developed to train Iranians as specialists in various sciences and technologies. Government legislation was created in 1928 in which various groups of students were annually sent to foreign universities for an education to later serve Iran's development. Reza Shah sent the first group of 110 Iranian students to France in October of 1928 to learn the principles of progress and modernism in Europe. Ironically, among this first group was Mehdi Bazargan the first prime minister appointed by Khomeini in overthrowing the Pahlavi dynasty. It was also Bazargan in 1963, during the onset of Khomeini's attack on the Shah, who published a letter supporting Khomeini while also criticizing and ridiculing the Shah for giving women the right to vote.
Mohammad Reza Shah continued this strategy of encouraging young Iranians to study abroad and attend the best schools offered. There were thousands of Iranian students across the globe, from the most obscure colleges to the greatest universities. They were sent to gather an education they could not get at home. In the mid-1970s, every single student abroad was receiving a minimum of $220 a month to help them continue their education. The Shah was expecting the arrival of a huge corps of graduates, which would help modernize their homeland in the early 1980s. The date he was claiming Iran would surpass all the third world countries, attaining the status and luxuries of a modern class nation, and becoming what he called a great civilization. The classic family connection, the chain which connects the elders to the youngest of the family in traditional societies like Iran, was broken, and a vacuum was created between the parents and younger children of the family with the departure of the students who traveled abroad for an education. The older brother or sister, who was once the catalyst, the generational bridge, was now gone. The danger of this generational gap was not understood by sociologists nor by the government of the Shah, who constantly resisted seeing both sides of the coin. But this generational gap did not escape the careful eyes of the Shah's opponents, who perhaps had a tougher time in convincing the young adults with their charges and accusations against the Shah. They first started recruiting among the young kids, and in no time, those young, 12, 13, 14 year olds, became a powerful army in the hands of the Islamic clerics. Their parents followed in a desperate attempt to catch their already lost children, who had been unleashed into the city streets to carry out the clerics' bidding. However, by following, they never got the status and respect they hoped to gain. Mass frenzy is contagious, and in no time, each individual tries to cross another red line, proving himself to others and proving himself worthy of attention. This set the stage for the not-so-bright intellectuals, writers, poets, philosophers, to claim leadership when knowing deep down that they were only desperate followers who were competing for a part of the status quo. Much of the student generation abroad returned home, jumping on the bandwagon and becoming pro-revolutionary to save face and to satisfy an expectant society. Other pro-revolutionary students remained in European and American cities while serving the clerics and their propaganda against the Shah. All from the comforts that were created and funded by the Shah himself. The remaining students abroad witnessed in shock as the country they loved so dearly changed in a matter of days into something so unimaginable.
unexpectedly having to settle their lives outside Iran, joined since by millions of mostly educated Iranians who fled the Islamic Revolution of 1979 and its aftermath, the Iran-Iraq War. creating a vast Iranian diaspora scattered across the globe. Their status different from the past. Before, they were simply Iranians. Nowadays, Depending on where they have settled, they have turned into Iranian-American, Iranian-German, Iranian-French, Iranian-Canadian, and altogether, global Iranians. most of them uncertain of their true identity with all the attachments and emotions for a cat-shaped region on the globe called Iran. Yet they are so far away from it. همین سیاستی که از قدیم سر ما پیاده کردن همیشه بینمون فاصله بوده همیشه بینمون فاصله بوده دلم میخواد یه چیزی بگم ما یه گوشه ای از تاریخ حبیتمون رو از دست دادیم یعنی غیرتمون رو باید بگریم اون کدوم قسمتش بود کجا بود که ما خودمون رو فراموش کردیم برگردیم به اون نقطه اونجا بازگشت به اصل کنیم اون وقت یه دون برای خیابون ما نمیسن یه دون برای خیابون انقلاب ایران و دانشجوها یا با سوادتر این مغزه دانشگاه تو ایران بوجود آوردن دیگه اخوندا که سواد ندارن که انقلاب بوجود بیارن یه کسی که رهبر این مملکت هست باید به نظر من هم چه خودی عقیده شخصی منه با پروفسور بشه با استاد دانشگاه بشه آدمای بی سواد نمیتونن مملکت اداره کنن اگه اخوندا واقعا انقلاب کردن خب اگه رهبر ایران اخوندا و اخوندا قدرت دارن یا مثلا خدا یا حضرت محمد هم بله امام حسین اونا رو واقعا خدا فرستاده اگه خمینی واقعا امام 14 بود اگه این امام چهارده هم بود ایران رو باید همونطوری قشنگ منظم درست میکرد که آلمانی ها آلمان درست کردن بعد جنگ جهانی دو بود
The biggest problem for Muhammad Reza Shah in dealing with a dominant ally was the ever-changing residence of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., the White House. Every four years, he had to educate the new residents to the basic geopolitical facts about Iran and the infrastructure of Iranian society, the true nature of who is who, where they come from, what they really want, and who is pulling the strings for them. Explaining time after time that the needs and priorities of Iran were not necessarily what the novice new residents of the White House and their advisors believed was true. This trend started with the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and continued through the times of Harry S. Truman. Your Majesty, I am happy to welcome you to the United States on this, your first visit here. I look forward to your Majesty's visit with great pleasure. And I trust that during its course, you may have the opportunity of becoming well acquainted with our country. Dwight David Eisenhower, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Richard Milhouse Nixon, Gerald Rudolph Ford, and the final disaster for the Shaw with the selective human rights brand, James Earl Carter Jr. With one exception, when a polished politician took the highest office of the United States. One who knew the geopolitics of the region, the Shah's vision, and his talent to create Iran's future. Nixon had learned all this while serving as vice president to Eisenhower. The interest of both of us is the same, to maintain our freedom, to maintain our peace, and to provide a better life for our people. He was also well aware of the nature of dislike at the beginning of Kennedy's presidency between his administration and the Shah. In fact, there is a known but less discussed story about John F. Kennedy before his presidency and General Taimur Bakhtiar, the ambitious and much feared head of Savak at the time of its inception following the infamous day of August 19, 1953, Bistahash de Mordad. Kennedy had met with General Taimur Bakhtiar while he was visiting America and promised him America's support if he staged a coup to overthrow the Shah. Bakhtiar, who didn't speak English, needed a confident translator during that meeting. This translator eventually informs the Shah, and it led to the fall from grace of Taimur Bakhtiar. His dismissal and his expulsion to exile in Iraq once in exile, Taimur Bakhtiar continued to organize his activities against the Shah's government from inside Iraq. In Rome, he made a secret alliance with Khomeini and the leader of the Rashrai tribe, Khosrow Rashrai, to overthrow the Shah. The plan was financed by Jamal Abdul Nasser, then president of Egypt and arch enemy of Mohammad Reza Shah. Bakhtiar was finally assassinated in the region near the Iran-Iraq border. Although later on, the Shah was received warmly by President Kennedy in his trip to the United States, the story was not easily forgotten. Nixon was also aware of another damaging action against the Shah and the highly nationalistic society of Iran. Initiated by the Kennedy administration, and pushed through by the Johnson administration. 
denying Iranian authorities the right to prosecute American military personnel who committed crimes within Iran. Again, we thank you. Bosham Motoshikeri. Nixon also knew that the land reform in Iran could have been handled much better if not for the pressure from Washington. The Shah and Nixon were in harmony with each other. A feeling of mutual acceptance and respect that the Shah did not have with any other U.S. presidents. Their understanding and trust of each other went years before Nixon's presidency. Nixon had met the Shah and traveled to Iran as the U.S. Vice President. They had many informal discussions and shared each other's vision. It was a trying time for the Shah to re-establish himself as an independent king with its own progressive agenda. For Nixon, it was a time to train himself as a politician who would understand the complexity of the world politics, and in particular, the Mideast situation and a realistic possible solution for this man-made troubled region. Nixon was preparing himself for the presidency of the United States with a level of understanding the outside world that no other U.S. presidents ever had. And the Shah was re-educating himself about the reality of U.S. politics, politicians, true sources of power, the limits, the potentials, and the real process of decision-making in the United States. The two were a perfect pair to help each other reach their goal. A dream team in the global politics arena. Nixon's plans were disrupted and delayed when... John F. Kennedy defeated GOP standard bearer Richard Nixon in one of the closest presidential elections on record. The youngest man ever elected president takes the burden from the oldest ever to hold the office as America enters the critical and challenging 60s. And Lyndon Johnson was elected as the incumbent in 1964. Meanwhile, the Shah had to deal with two new U.S. presidents. He in particular had a hard time dealing with the dreamers of Kennedy's administration, who could not differ idealism and fantasy with the reality of the real world outside America. 